Joshua chapter number 24, please, at the very end of the book. Joshua chapter 24 uh, comes after Deuteronomy and before Judges. Uh, the book of Joshua chapter 24. We've been in Joshua as the Lord has led us the last few messages um, in Joshua chapter 1. Uh, and then this morning, Joshua chapter 13. I hope you've got those messages and, and the Lord spoken to you. Uh, this morning we learned that the Lord spoke to Joshua and said, there's much more land that I have for you to possess. When he was an old man, and uh, the Lord said, you're not done, you're not through, but I have much more for you to possess. And then we come to chapter 24 this afternoon, and this here is at the end, really the end of it all, the end of his life when he has done all that the Lord has called him to do. And then this particular passage comes to the end of his life and then to the end of the book where ultimately uh, he passes away and uh, then things go from there. But Joshua chapter 24, uh, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. If you will, please stand together one more time and we'll read this um, before the message. Uh, Joshua chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came unto the sea. And the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, that you might possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam, therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. And he went over Jordan and came unto Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. A lot of ites there, isn't there? And I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not, and you dwell in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which you planted not, do ye eat. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord." And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Notice that final phrase that it all leads up to in a great culmination. Here Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's begin in prayer. Father, we just thank you for the privilege to be together. We know that this is not so easy in many other places. We do not take it for granted. But we thank you we can come together and the, how the power of the Holy Spirit speaks in these meetings. And Lord, thank you for speaking to our hearts. I pray that you would give us the food from heaven, the manna from heaven that we need in this very moment, speak to every heart in this room, every person who may be hearing, listening at any time, at any place. I pray that you would speak to their hearts. I pray that every word that comes out of this mouth would be, Thus saith the Lord. I pray that it be pleasing in your sight. Forgive us, Lord, 
where we failed you in our words or our actions or thoughts. Cleanse us and use us now, we pray. And we love you. We thank you for your love and, and salvation and goodness and for the word of God. Please now speak to us and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Here in Joshua chapter 24, uh, we come to the end of Joshua's life. And here Joshua, um, as we learned this morning, Joshua has become uh, the leader of the children of Israel when Moses passed away in Deuteron the end of Deuteronomy, and then he gives the baton to Joshua, and Joshua leads from that point on. He leads this mighty army of the children of Israel, and the Lord says, Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And the Lord promised him that, and not one thing failed, not one thing faltered of the promises that God had given to Joshua. But all through his life, God was with him. And we find in the book of Joshua, uh, the conquest of Canaan. We find in the book of Joshua all the kings and all the kingdoms that were subdued before the children of Israel, not because Joshua was strong, not because the children of Israel knew how to fight, but because the Lord was with them as He had promised. And He promised that He would be with the children of Israel as they fought these uh, countries and these lands and these kingdoms. And so then we come now towards the end of Joshua's life, and then the Lord speaks to Joshua as we learned this morning in chapter 13, and he says to him, Joshua, you're old, you're well stricken in age, but there remaineth yet very much land to possess. As we learned this morning, uh, Joshua was told by the Lord, yes, there's many things that have been accomplished, and I've been with you all the way up to this point, but the truth of the matter is, there is much that has not been done that is to be done. And in order that my promises and all that I said to you would come to pass with the children of Israel um, receiving and inheriting the land of Canaan, he said there is much more land, and in fact a great expanse of land, that still is to be possessed by the children of Israel. And so he says, Joshua, there is much more. There is much more than you need to possess. And we learned this morning how it did not matter uh, the age that he was, but God said, I want you to accomplish this. And uh, he talked about the time, the amount that he was to possess, and then the land that he was to go into. And we remind ourselves today, it doesn't matter uh, how young, it doesn't matter how old, but all of us need to recognize that it's not over that God has very much more that He wants for our lives, and we don't want to miss it, do we? We don't want to miss all that God has for our lives, but the truth of the matter is, every single one of us could say today, there is much more, there is much more that God wants you and I to possess in our own Christian lives, that we've not reached some kind of a plane or some kind of a peak where we can't go further, but we can always go further with the Lord and uh, possess more that God has um, given to us and promised to us in the Christian life. So when the Lord tells Joshua that, then they begin the, their conquest. They continue to uh, subdue all these kingdoms. And then in chapter 24, we're skipping those periods, but then in chapter number 4, we come to, or 24, we come to the very end of Joshua's life. When he's about to give up the ghost, he's about to, uh, as they would say, to be gathered to his people and his life comes to an end, and we find here that Joshua, in chapter 24, he gathers all the elders of the people together, and he says, this is God's message to you. This is God's message to you. This is what God wants you to hear. And he begins at the very start of the whole thing, and he talks about Abraham and Nahor and Terah and all those in the land of Canaan, where God initially promised, right? Because God said to Abraham, I want you to look up. And if you can count the stars that you see in the sky, then may your seed be numbered. If you can count the sand that is on the seashore, then your seed can be numbered. And of course, we understand the rhetorical question and answer uh, that we cannot count the stars. We cannot count the sand that is on the seashore. And the Lord says, so will your seed not be numbered. And he says, Isaac, through Isaac will come your seed. And so he goes all the way back to this. 
And Joshua explains about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and that God even uh, gave an inheritance to uh, Esau and Mount Seir and then Jacob by the children of Israel and goes into telling the whole story of the, uh, the history of the children of Israel and all that they went through. But some of his last words were, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he says to them, Now look, you can go back to the gods of your father, the fathers on the other side of the flood, in other words, the other side of the river. You can, go, you can go back to worshiping them, or you can worship the gods in the land that you're dwelling in, the land of the Amorites. He says, I don't know what you're going to do, but I know what I'm going to do. And by the way, all of us, we, we can't decide <laughs> what anyone else is going to do. And we wish, we wish that they would do the right thing. But the best example is that we choose. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anybody else does. I will serve the Lord. And that must be the decision that each of us makes. But I want to give you uh, two. Now, you might uh, uh, a good Baptist preacher gives three, right? We're going to deviate from that a little bit. How about it? Two big things, all right? Two things from this passage. That's all we need. Two things that I noticed that we need to understand in this matter of serving the Lord. You say, what does it mean to serve the Lord? It means to follow Him. Uh, that's what the children of Israel were called to do, to follow the Lord each step of the way when, as we said before, as the cloud would uh, ascend from the tabernacle, they were to go. When it was staying there, they were to stay when he was going before them, they were to follow. And uh, they were to follow him each step of the way and not be distracted, not deviate from the Lord because of other gods and other things that would come in and would tempt them to uh, uh, just ignore the Lord and cease from serving him, but instead to make the decision to serve him. And I see here, number one, I see the reason for serving the Lord. I see the reason for serving the Lord. He says in verse 14, Now therefore, fear the Lord. He says, therefore, in other words, what I've just said to you is the very reason that we should be serving the Lord. What I've just said to you. And I want to give you uh, uh, four things that come into play when it comes to the reason why we serve the Lord. Now, we could perhaps give many reasons. I could ask you, why do you serve the Lord? And perhaps there's many valid answers we could give to that. But notice in this passage that there are four things that are the reasons that Joshua said you ought to be serving the Lord. Number one was his deliverances. And he talked about how God had delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. Remember, they were in slavery and in bondage to Egypt. And the Lord delivered them out of that, right? By the Passover. The Passover lamb that was slain and the death angel passed over them and the Lord delivered them from the Egyptians. Now let me ask you a question. I want you to think about this. Has the Lord ever delivered you? Amen. Has He ever redeemed you Amen. out of the land of slavery and bondage? Amen. If, he's done, if He's done that for you, then there's a reason to serve the Lord. You know, there's always a reason for everything God says. You know, sometimes when you tell your child something, you say, they say, now pick that up. And they say, why? You say, because mama said it. You say, because daddy said it. But the Lord doesn't operate that way. He doesn't say, just do what I say, even though he, he could. But he says, here's the reason. Here's the reason. Here's why you serve the Lord, because he's delivered you. And he talks about in Israel how that he had delivered them from Egypt. And then when they had come out of Egypt, they went through the wilderness for those 40 years, which could have taken six weeks, but it took 40 years because of all the lessons that they had to learn over that time. But then when they come again to the land of Canaan, he delivers them again. He continues to deliver them. He delivers them from their enemies. He delivers them from the plagues that were in Egypt. He delivered them time and time and time again. And I'm saying to you today, if you are a Christian, if you're saved by the grace of God, then God has delivered you. He's delivered you from the bondage and the enslavement of sin. He's delivered you from it. And throughout your life, as you've looked to Him, I'm sure He has delivered you many times from things. You know, sometimes I think in my own life, I think in my life, 
You know, many times the Lord delivered me not only out of something, but from it. And by the way, we ought to be thankful for that. There are two major kinds of testimony. Someone may have a testimony that says, Oh, God took me out of this horrible life of sin and all these things I was doing, and God took me out of it. And what a wonderful testimony that is, isn't it? When God takes someone out of sin. But then there's a testimony of that God delivered you from it. And you were never in it. God delivered you from it. From being in that. And you know, God did both for these Israelites. He delivered them out of it when they were in bondage. And He delivered them from it when they were in uh, the wilderness and wandering. The Lord delivered them from their enemies and delivered them from many things. And although they murmured along the way and they sinned along the way. But what I'm saying to you today is that as a Christian, you have been delivered. You've been delivered. And because you've been delivered. That's the reason to serve the Lord. That's the first reason. Secondly, we see the victories, the deliverance, and we see, secondly, the victories. And he talks about how he brought them uh, into the land of the Amorites and how that he destroyed them from before the children of Israel. And he talks about Balak and the Amorites and the Perizzites and all the ites. He talks about all them and how that they won those battles. And in this passage, we find that they did not win those battles in their own strength, did they? They did not win the battle by being expert in war. They didn't win the battle because they were stronger than them, because they were, in, in all actuality, they were weaker, weren't they? They were weaker. Remember how the spies were sent by Moses uh, over, over into the land of Canaan? They said, these men are giants, and we're like grasshoppers. And they looked at them and said, we can't beat these people. And by the way, they were telling the truth. They couldn't. They couldn't be. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? A little guy like me trying to fight Goliath or something? It would just, it would not happen. It would not, I would lose. Would lose. The truth of the matter is, when they come to that, when that land, they find, yes, no, we, we cannot. We cannot win. We cannot beat these people. But the Lord fought the battle. The Lord fought the battle for them. And uh, you and I must learn. We must learn to depend on the Lord for the victories that we need. Because let me just tell you something, that, that the devil is not somebody you can defeat. Your flesh is not something that you can defeat in your own power. You can't. The world is not something that you're going to be stronger than, and the influences of the world will be stronger than you. But with the Lord, He'll fight the battle. And when He fights the battle, when He fights the battle, then we can get victory. Then we can get victory. We see the victories that they, they won. And I love the song. We just sang it, Victory in Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, the victory we have is not in ourselves, but it's in Christ. And Christ gives us the victory. There's deliverances and victories. And if the Lord has ever given you victory in your life, then that's a reason to serve the Lord. That's a reason to serve the Lord. I see deliverance. I see victories. I see... A third thing that we find their protection was another reason. Protection. What does he say here in verse number 11? You went over Jordan and came into Jericho. And it talks about all these different Canaanites that they encountered. And I delivered them into your hand and I sent the hornet before you. And by the way, I hate hornets. How many of you hate hornets? Say amen. How many of you like hornets say amen? I didn't think so. Some of you almost were thrown off there for a second. But I can't, I, I hate hornets. If I see something like that, that it's got a stinger on or something, I, uh, I get away from that thing as quickly as I possibly can. Can you imagine this? The Lord sent hornets. That's how he got rid of them. By the way, I don't care what side of the battle I'm on. If I see hornets coming after me, I'm going. All right? And he sends hornets after them, and they drive out. The children, the, 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 all these different nations. He sends a hornet to drive out all these Canaanites and Perizzites and Hittites and all them. He, he, he drives them out. Isn't God so wise that he would use hornets to do it? Such a wonderful idea. He uses these hornets. And what I'm saying to you today is God, through sending those hornets to drive out the Canaanites, he was protecting the children of Israel. He was protecting his people and let me just say to you today that many times we don't even know how God is protecting us. We don't even know how God's protecting us. 
And uh, I think if we did, we would get a big head about it. We'd say, oh, look how God's protecting me. Look what he's doing for me. God just keeps it all hidden. We don't know how he's protecting us. But sometimes he's sending those hornets to get rid of something that could be destructive to our lives. The Lord is protecting us. And I think all of us could look back on our lives, and if we just had a few moments to contemplate on it, we would think, God has protected me time and time and time again. I know that when I was not seeking after the Lord and I was 15, 16 years old, I know for sure that God protected me from some things that I was that close to. I was almost there. I was that close, but God protected me. And God protected you. And if God has protected you, it's a reason to serve Him. If God has protected you, it's a reason to serve Him. And then I see not only the protection, but notice a fourth thing, the blessings, the blessings that God gave. This is a reason to serve Him. Deliverance, victories, protection. The Lord did it. Protection the Lord provided. We think sometimes we can protect ourselves, but we find we're very vulnerable, very vulnerable, but the Lord protects us. And then I see a fourth thing is the blessings. What are the blessings that God gives? Verse 13, oh, I love this. Look at this. Read it with me. And I have given you, he says, a land for which you did not labor. Let that sink in for a moment. I have given you a land for which you did not labor. Let me ask you, how many, how many blessings are there in your life that you did absolutely nothing to earn them? How many blessings are in your life that you know for sure, I don't deserve them? I can think of many. I do not deserve these blessings. I didn't do anything to earn them, and that begins with salvation. I just trusted in Christ for my salvation and called on Him to forgive my sin and save my soul, and I did not do anything to earn it. I didn't do anything to earn it. Not, not any good in my own life that would merit God's salvation. And none of the blessings that I have or that you have in your life do you actually deserve. None of those blessings do you actually deserve. But He gives us those things we didn't labor for. Those things we didn't labor for. And He says, I've given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which He built not. And you dwell on them. You know what's the perpetually amazing to me? Is the fact that every day I constantly enjoy blessings that I did nothing to earn. That's what amazes me. That I constantly enjoy things that are just only by virtue of God's mercy, by God's amazing grace. I don't deserve them. I don't deserve them. He says, you dwell in them. Of the vineyards and the olive yards which you planted, do you not eat? I love what the lady's saying this morning uh, about the blessings that we have in our lives, even just feet that we can walk with and shoes on our feet and clothes on our back and a food with plenty of, a uh, table with plenty of food in front of us, right? Amen. A lot of food there. We have everything we can possibly need. We may not have everything we want, which is a good thing. Amen. But we have all that we need. And God has given us all these wonderful things in the friends and family that God has given us and those that He's given us to be part of the family of God. God has given us all these wonderful things. A vineyards, olive yards, which He plenty did not eat. We have to look back on our lives and stop taking His blessings for granted. We stop taking His blessings for granted and thank Him every single day that He gives us vineyards and olive yards which we did not plant. And He gives us a land for which we did not labor he gives us these things. These are blessings from God. And dear friends, let me just say to you, if I can't think of any other reason, that's a reason to serve God. Because of His blessings, it's a reason to serve Him. His deliverance, His uh, victories, His protection, uh, His blessings. So that's number one. Number one, the reason for serving the Lord. Number two, we see the choice that must be made. That's where it gets hard sometimes. Number one, we see the reasons for serving Him. We can understand it, the reason. The reason for serving Him. But then number two, I see the choice that must be made. What's the choice? He says in verse 14, Now therefore, as the old preacher would say, every time you see the word therefore, you've got to figure out what it's there for. Therefore, because of all of this, here's the reason Fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity 
and truth. Sincerity is unfeigned. It's real. Sincerity is genuine. That means we do it because we truly desire it with our heart. Serving the Lord is not just some motion that we perform. Serving the Lord is not just some action that we have to do. But it's what we get to do. It's what we get to do. We, we happily serve Him because of all He's done. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods of your fathers. He said, put them away. The gods of the father of your fathers. That they served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. All the gods that your father served before they even went to Egypt. And all the gods in Egypt. He said, put them away and serve ye the Lord. Serve ye the Lord. Now, let me pause there for a moment. What are gods? When he says the gods that your father served and the gods of Egypt, what are gods? Would you write this down? A god is anything that gets in the way of serving God. A god, little g, a god, little g, is anything that prevents, anything that prevents or that gets in the way of our service to God. Anything that makes us not fully Dedicate in our service to Him. That's a, that's a little g-god. That's a little g-god. And He says, put them away. Put them away. And He says, all these gods that your father served, the other side of the flood in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. In verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. This is the choice that must be made. We see the reason... The reason for our service to the Lord, number two, the choice that must be made. What is the choice? The choice is either serve the Lord or not. You might say, well, you're preaching to the choir. We're serving the Lord. We're here on that Sunday afternoon service. Well, is there any gods in our lives? Is there anything that prevents the service? Maybe we say we're serving God, but that's the choice. That's the choice that must be made. As has uh, been wisely said, as has been wisely said, taking the high road in life is not choosing between the good and the bad, but choosing between the good and the best, and always choosing the best, which is the unending pursuit of Jesus Christ. What we deal with in life is not choosing just between good and bad, and between serving God and not serving God, but between good and the best, and always choosing the best. What does that mean? It means that we have to get rid of all the little gods. We say, I'm a Christian. I'm serving God. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. But all the gods must be destroyed. All the gods. Anything that would hinder, impede, or prevent our service to God is a little, is a little G God. And if we're going to take the high road in life and be all that God wants us to be, we're not just choosing between good and the best, but choosing between or choosing good and the bad, but between the good and the best. And always choosing the best, which is the unending pursuit of Jesus Christ. And this is choosing the very best. I'm choosing this day whom I will serve. And, and Joshua says, listen, <laughs> I'm not saying choose tomorrow or choose later, but he says, choose this day. Choose right now. This is a now decision. This is a now decision, not one you put off and say, oh, I'll decide later, because the truth of the matter is, as we learned this morning, the later may never come. But we must make the decision, not in the later, not in the future, but right now, this day, I will choose whom I will serve. He says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers... The gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me, Joshua says, as for me, I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We all must make the choice. We all must make the decision. It must be a decision that we make. And don't be ashamed of it. Because truly serving the Lord and putting away all the gods many times is, can be made fun of. Many times that's a decision that others don't like, understand, or approve of. 
Many times that's a decision. Others say, well, he's a fanatic. Or she's a weirdo. Well, who cares? If I'm going to serve the Lord, I must understand that many people won't like it. Many people won't like it. But I don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to do. But I choose this state. I will serve the Lord. That is the choice that we all must make. And I'm not just talking about living for God or not living for God. I'm talking about choosing. I'm going to get rid of all the gods. I'm going to get rid of anything that hinders, anything that keeps me from serving God, that prevents me. Because I want to choose this day that I will serve the Lord. We see the reason. What's the reason for serving Him? Deliverance, victories, protection, and blessings. And then what is the choice? The choice that must be made. Will I get rid of all the gods? Will I choose this day whom I will serve? Who will you serve? Who will you serve? Who will you serve? Will you serve something or someone that is distracting you from the Lord? Or will you choose the Lord? Or will you choose to get rid of the other things? Sometimes those are sacrifices we have to make. To get rid of things. Will you choose that instead of those things, I this day I will serve the Lord?